Oh, my name is Adam. This is the official SAT practice test number one. This video is for section four of that test, which is the math with calculator section. On the SAT, you get 55 minutes to complete this section. We'll take a little longer to go over every problem in depth. This is the second of these videos I've recorded, so uh, bear with me if I stutter through any ums and ahs. <laughs> Let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, calculator section problem one. To give you is a graph with an accompanying paragraph, always start with what is it they're really asking me for, on which interval is the target heart rate strictly increasing, then strictly decreasing. So what they're asking for is when is there a period where there's no plateau between an increase and a decrease. Right here we see an increase. On this first section we see an increase, then a decrease. That's not what they're looking for. This looks like an increase and decrease. That's probably what they're looking for. Everywhere else, we have a plateau between our increase and decrease, which means that this is the interval they're looking for. We go down our graph. They're asking for it in terms of the time, the x-axis, which means that it is between 40 minutes and 60 minutes. This is occurring. That is answer B. Problem number two. What they're looking for is the value of y when x is equal to negative 5 in this equation, y is equal to kx. Additionally, they give you another point, y and x, such that you can figure out the constant k. So start by writing out y is equal to kx, plug in for your first values, your known values of x and y, which will give you k. So 24 is equal to k times six. 24 divided by six is four that k is equal to 4. You can go back, plug in that k equals 4 with now using your value of x is 5. So you have y is equal to 4 times 5 and that will result in y is equal to 20 and that is your answer C. Problem number three, geometry problem. What they're asking for is what is the measure of angle number two? Circle it on your drawing. The other information they give you is that the lines L and M and S and T are parallel, which means that this angle number one is the same here, 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 and here. Where that's important is now we know that this angle is 35, and since it's on this straight line, we know that this whole angle has to sum to 180, which means we can write an equation, 180 is equal to angle two plus 35, Subtract 35 from both sides, that leaves you with angle 2 is equal to 145, and that is answer D. Problem number 4, what are they looking for? The value of 8 times x. So we can call the answer we're looking for y is equal to 8 times x. And then use this other <clears throat> information, 16 plus 4x is, which means it's equal to 16 plus 4x is equal to... 10 more than 14, so 14 plus 10. So that means that 16 plus 4x is equal to 24. 24 subtract 16, 4x is equal to 8. It means that x is equal to 2, divide both sides by 4. Go ahead and plug that back into your equation up top. That will give you y is equal to 8 times 2, which is equal to 16. Your answer is C. Problem number five, they're looking for which graph of the ones below show a strong negative association between D and T, which are shown on the X and Y axis respectively on these. So it's important to recognize they're looking for a negative association, which means a negative slope. In B, that's clearly not a negative slope. C is clearly not a negative slope. You can eliminate those. A, it looks like there might be some negative slope, but it's hard to really make that conclusion. And D is a s obvious negative slope. So what are they looking for? Are they looking for a loose correlation? They're looking for a strong negative association. It's clear that D has the strongest negative correlation, and D is your correct answer. Okay, problem number six. They're looking for how many one milligram doses are in one two decagram container. The first bit has about hospitals and such. You don't actually need any of that information. It is a straight units conversion problem for two decagrams to milligrams. So you can start with two decagrams. You can use the unit conversions they give you up here. Um, 
because you're converting from decagrams, it goes in the denominator. And you have that there are 10 grams in one decagram. Cross out your decagrams. And then you need to convert from grams. So you have that there is one gram in 1,000 milligrams. And now your units are in milligrams. Multiply through. You have 2 times 10 is 20 times 1,000 will be 20,000. So 2 decagrams is equal to 20,000 milligrams. That's your answer. Problem number seven. They have a bar graph on here and they give you a paragraph. And first thing, identify what it is they're looking for. What is an appropriate label for the vertical axis of the graph? Basically, what are the units over here? Or what is the multiplier over here? And they give you that every bar sums to 27,500. So you take a look and know that each of these, you have 3.5, you have 4, you have 6, you have 5, and you have 9. You could add all these up and find that they come to 27.5. And you know that that has to equal, times some number x, has to equal 27,500. So what is that number x? So if you do, if you divide by x is equal to 1,000, which means that the number, the multiplier for your y-axis is thousands. So your answer is C, number of installations in thousands. Problem number eight, they're looking for what value can you plug in for n in this expression to make the expression equal to zero? Um, what they're really looking for here is for you to say, okay, inside of this absolute, there's no way for this to be negative, and you have a plus one, so it's not possible for this to equal zero, and the answer is D. Um, there's only, but if you look and you say, you know, it's a stressful test, you don't jump straight to that conclusion. You only have three options here. You can quite simply plug in each of those options. If you plug in zero for N, your absolute term becomes negative one, but absolute, it becomes plus one. Your answer is two. If you plug in the one, it becomes zero in the absolute, plus one is equal to one. You plug in two, it becomes positive one in the absolute term, plus one becomes two, and you say none of those work. My answer must be D, there is no such value of N. Okay, problem nine. Um, they start with a big explainer up top and then ask their question. It's important, always look at what they're asking first. So which of the following expresses the air temperature? And if you look above, it says air temperature T in terms of speed of the sound wave, A. So all they're asking for is for the equation to be in terms of A. And when they say in terms of, that just means rearrange to put it in that term. So you can just rearrange your equation. You'll see, you know, they're talking about Fahrenheit and speed of sound and all that. And if you're a physics-minded person, that probably puts you into like, I need to solve a physics problem here. It's not the case. You just have to rearrange an equation. So take, you have A minus 1052 is equal to 1.08 T. Divide by 1.08. That will give you T is equal to A minus 1052 by 1.08, go have a look, you'll find that that answer exists as answer A, and that is the correct solution. Okay, problem number 10, it starts by referring to that same information you used in problem nine, but what are they actually asking for in this problem? At which of the following air temperatures will the speed of sound, be sound wave be closest to 1,000 feet per second? So basically what they're saying is substitute in that 1,000 feet per second in for A, and then what is T? Now I'm not a huge fan of this problem because it kind of relies on you getting the previous problem correct where you solve in terms of um, T, but hopefully you did that correct or you could do it again and say that T is equal to A minus 1052 divided by 1.08. This is the calculator section, so at this point you can just go ahead, plug that 1,000 feet per second in for A, and that will leave you with T is equal to, would you do the math, plug into your calculator, it's equal to negative 
0.15, and they're looking for which is the closest. Um, which will be closest. It doesn't say closest up, closest down. It just says closest. So you'll round this down, and the correct answer is T is equal to negative 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Problem number 11, they're asking for which of the solutions they give is not a solution to the inequality given here. Uh, that inequality can obviously be simplified, so you can start by doing 3x, add 5 to both sides. For addition, you don't need to flip the sign. 4x plus 2, negative 3 plus 5 will be plus 2. At this point, you can subtract 4x from both sides. That will give you negative x. Negative equal to 2. At this point, multiply by negative 1. That will give you x. You do flip the sign for negative multiplication. It will give you negative 2. So x must be less than or equal to negative 2. At that point, you can go through all of your answers and take a look. x must be less than negative 2. This one makes it. So yes, that is of solution. x must be yes, that's less than or equal to negative 2. Yes, that's less than or equal to negative 2. a is not less than or equal to negative 2. And that's your solution. Problem 12. What they're looking for here is the average number of seeds per apple where they give their data in a histogram above. And if you're rusty looking at histograms, basically a histogram can be broken back down into a list for each individual apple of how many seeds it has. So there are two apples with, for instance, there are two apples with three seeds. So you could list three seeds, three seeds, and then there were four apples with five seeds. You could list five seeds, five seeds, five seeds, five seeds, one apple with six seeds, etc. Now this type of a problem, histograms are really good at, you can sort of eye up the mean from a test um, taking perspective. What I'd probably do is take a look at this, say, yeah, it's probably about six, just looking at a histogram and bubble in C with the intention of coming back to it if I have time to do it right. Um, the way to do it right would be to say, okay, I can actually calculate that mean. So you can say I have uh, two apples with three seeds plus I have four apples with five seeds plus I have one apple with six seeds plus I have two apples with seven seeds plus I have three apples with nine seeds. And this is the calculator section. You can throw all that in and come up with a total of 73 divided by the number of apples is 12 and that will give you 6.08, and you are very close to that arithmetic mean of 6, and that is your answer. Okay, problem 13. Before reading all the background, ask what are they looking for, and it's which of the following categories accounts for approximately 19% of all the survey respondents. And the key word there is all, because they're looking for which category, which subcategory, represents 19% of this total, total group. So they're not looking for which represents 19% of the males or the females. They're looking for which represents 19% of the total group. So take this total number, this 310, multiply it by 19%, 0 0.19, and this is the calculator section. So plug that into your calculator and you'll end up with 58.9. So next, take a look at the chart and ask which number here is closest to 58.9, effectively 59. <clears throat> and what you'll see is that males taking geometry make up that 19%, that 59 number. So if males taking geometry C, it is an answer choice, and that is the correct answer. Problem 14. They give you a list of data with one outlier, and they're asking, which will change the most if the 24 inch measurement, the outlier, is removed from the data? And so they're talking about coming out here and striking this from the data. And they're asking which will change the most, mean, median, or range. And they're effectively asking you if your knowledge on the definitions here of these three things. So when you remove that 24, the range is easy to see what the change will be. The range before was the range before was eight to twenty-four whereas now the range is 8 to 16. So the range has been reduced by 8. 24 minus 16 is the reduction in the range. The median, the median just estimating will be somewhere in the middle of the data, you know, in this area. 
So by removing one, one data point, you really didn't move the median much. You probably just changed it from 12 to 12 or 12 to 13 without actually going through and counting. So there, that only changed by about one. The mean is similar in that the mean will have changed more than the median, but it's still only removing one data point. You won't have shifted the entire data set. With this large of a data set, it will not have shifted as much, and it cannot have shifted as much as the range did, as the range of eight shifted. So your correct answer here will be that the range had the most change. Okay, question 15. They give you a graph, but always jump to the question first. What are they asking for? What does the C-intercept represent in the graph? And they give you a list of options. And you can sort of look at intercept is almost always the initial condition, right? So and then you can confirm that on the graph. C, the total cost in dollars of renting this boat, is the intercept at time zero. So it's your sunk cost before you do anything on the boat. You still have to pay this amount of dollars before you do anything. It's the intercept. It's the initial. And so right off the bat, when you go through writing these, reading these options, you can see that initial cost of renting the boat, um, that's sort of the definition of intercept, um, is the correct answer. You can look at the other ones to throw them out. The total number of boats rented, the graph has nothing to do with number of boats rented. Um, the total hours that the boat was rented, that's not um, the intercept. The intercept is the initial condition. And then the increase in cost to rent the boat each additional hour. This is the only other thing that actually is represented on the graph um, because of the slope, but it is not um, correct for the intercept. A is the correct answer. Okay, problem 16. They're asking about the same graph as the previous problem. What are they asking for specifically in this problem? They're asking which of the following represents the relationship between H and C. They're saying represents the relationship. That's code for what's the equation. So equation of a line, Y is equal to MX plus B, where M is the slope, B is the intercept. You can start by looking for the slope. So slope is rise over run. So for a run of one hour, you have a rise of $3 from five to eight. So that means that M is equal to three over one or simply three. At that point, you can go and eliminate A and B from contention. That is a slope of five. This is a slope of three fourths. Neither of those are correct. C and D still both have a slope of three. So you have to look at what is the intercept. And the intercept here is it costs $5. Um, that's the initial condition just to rent the boat. Um, so your y equals mx plus b will be 5. C is the answer that has both the slope and intercept correct. D only has the slope. That would be if it was 0, it's incorrect. C is your correct answer. Problem number 17. They give a somewhat complicated looking graph. So always ask yourself, what are they really looking for here? What is the value of x that the value of f of x is at its minimum? Um, important thing to recognize, f of x just means y. So where is y at its minimum? You can follow the graph down, see that this is the minimum point. Where does that occur on the x-axis? It occurs at x is equal to negative 3. So your correct answer is b, negative 3. Problem 18, they're asking for which of the following relationships between a and b must be true. And what they're giving you is what looks like a system of equations and one point where that satisfies that system of equations. So you can jump right in by plugging that point into the first equation. What you'll get is 0 is less than a, which means that a must always be positive. And you'll get 0 is greater than b, which means b must always be negative. If b must always be negative and a must always be positive, it means that a is always greater than b. And that is your first choice right here. A is greater than B. It's the opposite of B is greater than A. Um, it says nothing about what their absolute value is. And it says nothing about what their values are at all, other than the one's positive and one's negative. So you can't conclude that they're equal. So it is, in fact, that A, A is always greater than B. Okay, problem 19. What they're asking for is how many of some item, in this case salads, were sold in a given day. And this is a pretty common type of problem on the SAT, where they're giving you two different types of items that are being sold, and they'll give you information about those items, both information about the cost and information about number of items sold. And it'll change which information they give. Sometimes they'll give the cost of both, which they're doing in this case, the total number sold and the total revenue made. In some cases, it'll be they'll withhold information about the cost of each individual item and give you the number sold. 
of each individual item and you have to solve for cost. In every case, what you have to do is set up a system of equations. And one system, one of those equations will be about the revenue. The other equation will be about the number sold and you can plug one to the other. So we'll go ahead and do that now. We'll start with, they start by giving you the price. So we'll start there too. The total amount of revenue will be equal to the revenue from the first item, salads, plus the revenue from the second item, drinks. And what is each of these individual terms? You can use that each drink costs 650 and the revenue will be times the number, the 650 times the number of drinks, the revenue or times the number of salads, 650 times the number of salads. The revenue from drinks will be the cost of the drinks, $2 times the number of drinks. You go ahead and plug all this back in for revenue. From the problem, we know the total revenue is 836.5, 836.5. Point five is equal to 6.5 times S plus 2 times D. That's as far as you can go with that equation. The next equation will be about the total number, the quantities sold. And in the problem, they give you that 209 was the total sold of both salads and drinks. So the total, the sum of salads and drinks. So you have salads plus drinks. Put that in terms of salads so that you can solve for drinks, basically. The number of drinks will be 209 minus the number of salads sold, and that can be plugged into your other equation. 36.5 is equal to 6.5s plus 2 times 209 minus s. Multiply through, simplify, you have 836.5 is equal to 6.5s plus 418 minus 2s. At this point, you can subtract 418 from both sides. This will be 6.5 minus 2, this will be 4.5s. You do this subtraction, it comes out to be 418. It's a calculator section, so just plug that into your calculator. Is equal to 4.5s. Divide both sides by 4.5. You're left with s is equal to 93. Again, do that on your calculator. You'll find that it corresponds to answer B. B is your correct solution. Okay, problem 20. What they're asking for is the original price of a product a computer in this case, knowing that you paid this P and some discounts were applied. So you had a 20% discount, but you had to pay an 8% sales tax. And they're looking to get what was the original price. And this one's tricky because they're asking for you to work backwards from the way you normally think about prices. Normally you see an original price and then apply a discount, come up with your final price. So I think the easiest way to go about this problem is write your equation out th this way. So we're normally used to thinking in terms of, okay, at the end I paid P. So we'll go ahead and put P on its own on the left side of the equation. So P is equal to, we'll call the original price N. And what did we do to N? We applied a 20% discount, so we only paid 80% of N, so we had 0.8, but we had to pay an 8% tax, which means we paid the price, the 1.08, the price went up. At this point, we can find what we're looking for is what was the original price, so we're looking to solve for N, so you can take N is equal to P, and just divide these these constants here by the whole thing. N is equal to P divided by 0 0.8 times 1.08. And that's all you need to solve the problem. You can go over here, see that that is solution D. Um, the rest of these do not work. These ones with the 0.88 are trying to get you to simplify the, the sales tax and discount. That's not applicable in this case, and this one is hoping that you mess up or trip up in thinking about what was the original or sales price. But no, the correct answer here is D. Okay, problem 21, they give you a table and some explanation about that table. And what they're looking for is if a person chosen at random 
from those who recalled at least one dream. So that's telling you that it's already what they're choosing from is some subset of that table. What is the probability that that person belonged to group Y? So what's the probability they came from an even smaller subset of that table? So write out your equation for probability. Probability is equal to the total number of people that you could be choosing from. So in this case, it's anyone who had more than one dream. So people who had more than one dream over the population that you're interested in. Did it come from the population you're interested in, which is group Y, who had more than one dream? So let's start by identifying this denominator first. So what is the group that had more than one dream? You can cross out in this table everyone who had none, because we're not choosing from that group at all. So the group of interest could be the total who had one to four dreams or that had five dreams. And that total is 164. And at this point, you could go over to your list of possible solutions and say, okay, there's only one with 164 in the denominator. And at this point, you could conclude it's C. We'll take the problem all the way to its solution. So the, the, the denominator, the group that you're interested in seeing if they are part of it, will be anyone who's in group Y. So of this total, you're only interested in the people who came from group Y. So it'll be 68 plus 11, that is indeed 79, and it confirms that C is your correct choice. Problem 22, they give you a big table which is annual budgets for different programs in Kansas. Before absorbing the table, read what they're going to be looking for. Which of the following best approximates the average rate of change in the annual budget for agriculture and natural resources in Kansas from 2008 to 2010? Okay, so referring back to your chart, you know that what you're looking for is agricultural natural resources. So all you'll be looking at is this row here. You'll be looking for which best approximates the, av the annual budget change between two years, so they have 2008 to 2010. So the numbers you'll be interested are this one and this one. The last thing to recognize is they'll be your answers all look like they're in millions of dollars. So if you look at the bottom, always read. If they give you more information below a table, they usually give it there for something. This leads to the annual budget in thousands of dollars. So each of these numbers multiply by a thousand to get the actual number in dollars. So what you have here, they're looking for the annual average rate of change. So you have from 2010, you had about $488 million as a budget. And in 2008, you had about $358 million as a budget. And of course there's numbers after that, but they're asking for an approximate. They're rounding to the nearest, it looks like, 5 million in their answers. So you don't need to worry about carrying all those places. So you have 488 minus 358 million. What you end up with is 130 million change. But remember, that's from 2008 to 2010. So that's over the course of two years. You need to divide this by two to get the annual rate of change, which leaves you with 65 million per year annual rate of change, which is B. Keep in mind they have 130 here to try to trip you up. Remember to divide by 2 because you're going over 2 years. The answer is B. Question number 23. We're using the same table as the previous problem with looking for a different solution. So what they're asking for, which of the following ratio of the 2007 budget to the 2010 budget is the closest to the human resource programs ratio between its 2007 budget and its 2010 budget. So from the problem, you know that the only columns you're going to be dealing with are the 2007 and 2010 budget. And the one you're going to be comparing to is the human resources programs ratio. So absolute numbers don't matter here. All they care about is the ratio between the budget in 2007 and the budget in 2010. So to calculate, there's a lot of significant figures we're carrying here. We'll just use the first three significant figures to calculate the ratio between the two. So we'll call that ratio is equal to 405, the first three significant digits over here, divided by 592, first three significant digits over here. And what you come up with 
is that that ratio is about 0.68. This is a little bit of a tedious problem because there's really no way around doing that for every every program to see which one comes the closest. So again, you'll take the ratio of 2007 to 2010. You only need to carry three significant digits. So in this case, it would be you know 373 divided by 488. And if you plug that in on your calculator, you come up with 0.76. And you can go through and do that for each of these rows, and you'll come up with these different numbers, 0 0.71. This one you come up with 0.97. For this one you will come up with 0.83. This one we already calculated 0.68. And this one you will come up with 0.56. At this point they're asking for the closest. They don't ask rounding up, rounding down. They're just asking for which is the closest to the human resources budget, which is 0.68. And if you look through, the closest you'll come is this 0.71 for the education bonus education program. So your answer is B, the education program. Problem 24. What they're asking you for here is the equation of a circle when you are given the center point and one point on that circle. And in this case you have to come into this having memorized two things really. There's not a lot you have to memorize in the SAT but these are two of them and I think I'll do a video later on things you have to memorize for the SAT. But one of them will be equation of a circle. You have to know the general form of equation of a circle is x minus h, where h is the center point in x squared plus y minus k, where k is the y center point, is equal to r squared, where r is the radius. So at this point, you can plug in for h and k. So h is just 0, so you'll have x squared plus y minus 4 squared is equal to r squared. At this point you can go and look at your answers and maybe you, you have the left side all figured out. So maybe at this point you can cross out enough to get you to your answer. B is that you can cross this one out because it has this y plus 4. That's incorrect. D also has that y plus 4. That is incorrect. But you're still left with A and C that have the correct left form of the equation. So the next thing you have to do is solve for this r squared. And that's the next point that you have to have memorized, which is the distance between two points formula. And it's similar to the Pythagorean theorem, where you have r squared, the distance between two points is equal to, where r is the distance between two points, is equal to um, basically y2 minus y1 plus squared plus x2 minus x1 squared. In this case, we have all of these points. We have y2, y1, x2, x1 as the center and the endpoint on that circle. So you can go ahead and write those values in. So you have 4, 5, minus 4 squared plus, and I'm getting the 5 plus 4 from the endpoint and the center, and I'll do the same thing for x, where I'll use the endpoint and the center, where you have 4 thirds minus 1, minus 0, sorry, squared. You can do r squared is equal to 1 squared plus 4 thirds squared, r squared is equal to 1, 1 squared is just 1, plus to do a fraction squared, you square the top, square the bottom, you have 16 over 9. Your 1 can be rewritten as 9 over 9. You have r squared is equal to, do that 9 over 9 so that you can add these two fractions together, that will leave you with 25 over 9. r squared can be plugged right back into your circle equation to leave you with x squared plus y minus 4 squared is equal to 25 over 9 and that matches answer A. Question 25. They give you an equation and what they're asking for from this equation after approximately how many seconds where seconds is t in that equation will the ball hit the ground and they give you that h is the height so you're looking for when h is equal to zero, what is the value of t? So start by 
going ahead and plugging in that zero for h. So you have you're at height zero is equal to that negative 4.9 t squared plus 25 t. And you know you need to solve for t. So we can pull t out. We can divide everything by t. Zero divided by t is still zero. So we have zero is equal to negative 4.9 t plus 25 where t is at the end. And we can see at this point that this will give us two different solutions. So we can get to this zero on the left side if t is equal to zero. And what that's signifying is that it was at height zero at the time this ball was fired. So we can go ahead and ignore that last term. t zero is not a valid solution. It's not one of our options here. They're looking for after the ball comes back to the ground. So now we have zero is equal to negative 4.9 t plus 25. We can subtract 25 from both sides. Negative 25 is equal to negative 4.9 t. Divide both sides by negative 4.9. t is equal to negative 25 divided by negative 4.9. And that will end up being a number just above 5. So you will end up with approximately 5 and that is available as a solution. Question 26, jump to the end. What are they asking for? How many pairs did type B trees produce? And what they're giving you is that type A trees produced 144 pairs and that type A trees were 20%, produced 20% more than type B trees did. So just from that information alone, you know that type A produced more than type B and type A produced 144, so you can throw out answer D because it's saying that type B produced more. That's incorrect. So let's go ahead and set up an equation for how much did type B actually produce. So we can say type B, actually we're going to do it the other way. We're going to say type A, how many did type A produce? Because they're giving you the information that type A produced 20% more treat more than type B. So it makes it easier to set this up in terms of type A. So we had type A is equal to the amount that type B produced plus the amount type B produced times 20%. So that times 0.2. So now what we're looking for is to solve this equation in terms of type B. So we're looking for how many did type B produce. So we can go ahead and say that A is equal to B. This might look better if I said B plus 0.2B because now you see that this is 1B. So you can say that A is equal to 1.2b so you can say that b is equal to a divided by 1.2 you can now use the information from the problem that type a produced 144 pairs you have 144 divided by 1.2 that will result in 120 pairs which is answer b problem 27 Big wall of text, table included. First start, what are they going to be asking for? What is a reasonable approximation of the number of earthworms to a depth of 5 centimeters beneath the ground surface of an entire field? So knowing that, go back to your problem. Now the entire field measures 10 meters by 10 meters. 10 students mark off a random section of the field. Each region is a square that has a side of 1 meter by 1 meter. So each sample is 1 square meter. And no two regions overlap. The students count the earthworms. Results are below. So they have this table. And each, so it, this is each in a one by one section. So a one square meter section. And you can look at each region and just sort of eye this up and say, okay, the average of all of these looks like it's about 150 worms per meter squared. And that's sort of confirmed by if you look at the form that the possible answers take. They each start with this 1.5. So the fact that you're approximating 150, it probably gets you close to that reasonable approximation that they're looking for. That's 150 worms per meter squared. And they throw 150 on here to tempt you to say, okay, that's what the answer is. They also throw 1,500 on here because if you just add up all the numbers here, it will, there's 10, 10 students took these samples, it will come to that 1,500. But rec recognize that they're asking for over the entire field across the ground surface of the entire field. And way back we saw the entire field was 10 meters by 10 meters. 
which is equal to 100 square meters. So you have to take 150 worms per meter squared times 100 meters squared to end up with 15,000 worms for the entire field. And thus the correct answer is C. Problem 28. What they ask for is which quadrant in the plot above contains no solutions to the system, where the system is defined by two equations that are given. And what they're really testing on is identifying that these are in Y is equal to MX plus B form, or Y is greater than MX plus B form. So we can start, and they're saying graphed on the XY plane above, so you can actually graph, graph yourself on the above. So start by identifying this. Positive one is the intercept of one line. So we'll throw some lines down to plot. Intercept of positive one, and it has a slope of two, which means a rise of two for a run of one. And you can put a line through that. And it is y is greater than, so it means that all solutions must be on this side of the line. And actually at that point, you can say it's only possible for solutions to be in quadrants one, two, or three, even before you plot the rest of the solution. So at this point, you can say the answer is C. Quadrant four is the only place that contains no solutions. The, the graph doesn't come through there. But to complete this problem, we'll see it all the way through to the end. We'll plot the other line. We'll say the intercept is negative one. And it has a slope of 1 over 2, so a rise of 1 for a run of 2. And that line is here, which means that the only place this has solutions is above this line, and it has to be above the other line as well. So the only place that these solutions exist is here. And you see that those two also touch 1, 2, and 3. So it confirms that the only quadrant that contains no solutions is quadrant 4. Your answer is C. Question 29, they're asking which of the following, so which of the answer selections must be true about P of X? And then you have to read through each answer. Three of them are, is this a factor of P of X? And the fourth is the remainder when P of X is divided by X minus three is minus two. The other information they give you about this polynomial is a single point. So at X is equal to three, the polynomial must be equal to negative two. And it's telling, they say the value of P of three is negative two. So there's one solution and it must be negative two. So you can start by constructing a polynomial that meets this requirement. So you have P of X and you know it must be equal to negative two, but because it's a polynomial, it has to have X to an exponent terms. So what would satisfy that? And it's helpful to think back to factoring of polynomials. So think that you have X minus three will have to be a factor of this polynomial. And the reason is that if X is equal to three, you'd have three minus three to make the zero, this factor will go away, leaving you with the minus two. In fact, because this is the solution, every factor in this polynomial will be X minus three. And you can include as many of these as you want, but this satisfies, you know, X minus X, you have X squared, make it a valid polynomial. At this point, We've concluded the only factor is this x minus 3. So you can go back to your possible solutions. x minus 5 is a factor. No, it's, it is not a factor. x minus 2 is not a factor. x plus 2 is not a factor. Only x minus 3 is a factor, which means that d is your correct solution. The remainder when p of x is divided by x minus 3 is negative 2. If you want to take it further, you could say, okay, p of x, I can check my answer d to say, okay, I'll divide that by x minus 3 like the answer says is equal to, we had x minus three, x minus three, divided by x minus three, cancel those out, will be negative two, divided by x minus three. And by definition, this minus two is the remainder, because you'll be left with x minus three, and then this fraction, two over x minus three, making negative two the remainder. So that makes this statement correct. The remainder when P of X is divided by X minus three is negative two. D is your correct answer. Question 30, they're asking which of the following of the answer choices is the equivalent form of the equation on the graphs on the XY plane. 
where the coordinates of vertex A can be identified as constants in the equation. And the end of that question really gives it away. They're saying where the coordinates of vertex A can be identified in the equation, which says what they're asking for is the vertex form of a parabola. So you may recall that vertex form is y is equal to x minus h, where h is the x coordinate of the vertex squared plus k, where k is the y coordinate of the vertex. At that point, you say, what is the vertex? They're asking about vertex A. Looks to be about x equals 1 and a little below 15, so negative 16. At that point, you can plug right into your vertex form and see that, okay, that takes the form of D, and D is your solution. Now, there's also the chance you could say, well, I don't remember the vertex form of a parabola. I blanked on that during the test. You can also go through and start eliminating things because they say of which the coordinates vertex A can be identified. The, your first step there would be, okay, what is that vertex? And I need a one and I need a negative 16. You know, which one of these solutions has a one and a 16 in it? And then from that, you can conclude D. And if you even wanted to pare it down even further, you can start to take a look and say, okay, which of these actually equals this equation up here? Because there is, you know, x plus 3, x minus 5, that does work. But this b, x minus 3, x plus 5, when you multiply that through, is not actually the same as that equation. So you can eliminate that one and make your life easier. And then you have to pick between, and you'd see that, okay, the vertex is 1 minus 16. This has a 1 and it has a minus 16. So d is the correct answer. Problem 31, what they're looking for, what is a possible amount of time in hours that I can take Wyatt to husk 72 ears of corn? So that must mean they give rate information earlier in the problem, and they do. Wyatt can husk at least 12 dozen ears of corn per hour, and at most 18 dozen corn, ears of corn per hour. And you can actually throw out this at most 18 dozen ears of corn per hour. You don't need that information. They're asking for a possible amount of time in this 12 dozen ears per hour is a possibility. So we'll just say he takes, he's the slowest and we'll use that as our possible amount of time. So what we're after in the end is T, the number of hours is equal to, you, we need to, him to get 72 dozens ears of corn. So we'll say dozen ears and we can multiply that by our rate. So we need in our denominator dozen ears and we know that he is doing 12 dozen ears per one hour from the information in the problem. And you can multiply that through and what you end up with is, and you will end up with hours, we confirmed our units. So we have 72 divided by 12 and that is equal to six hours. You can go ahead and bubble that in as your solution. Problem 32, what they're asking for is the maximum possible value of X that will keep the combined weight of the truck, driver, and boxes below the bridge's posted weight limit. And you go back early in the problem to find that X is the number of boxes that a truck is carrying, where the truck and driver are going to 4,500 pounds, and the weight limit that they're talking about is 6,000 pounds. And from the problem, what you're attempting to do is keep the combined weight truck driver and boxes below the bridge's weight limit. So you'll have an inequality that you're working with. So what you need to do is keep limit. Make sure that the limit is greater than what you're carrying. So limit is greater than total weight. And right there we can start plugging in from our problem. So we know the weight limit from the problem is 6,000 pounds. And that must be greater than the initial weight that we're starting out with, the 4,500, plus the 14 pounds times the number of boxes. So at this point, we have a linear equation. We can just start to solve that for x, which is what we want in the problem. What is the maximum possible value for x? So you do 6,000 minus 4,500. That will give you 1,500. Must be greater than 14x. Divide both sides by 14. That will leave you with, this is the calculator section, you can plug that into your calculator. That will leave you with 107.14 107, 
must be greater than X. It's important at this point to realize that X is a number of boxes and they're looking for a max. They're looking for carrying X identical boxes weighing 14 pounds. So they're looking for the most that this can be and you can't have a, a fraction number of boxes. So you just throw off, you'd round down anyhow, but even if it was a high number, say this ended up being 107.8 or something, you just throw off that last number because you can't round up. It would put you over the weight limit. So that means that X max 107 greater than X, so 107 is the answer that you would bubble in. Problem 33, according to the line graph above, the number of portable media players sold in 2008 is what fraction of the number sold in 2011? So you'll have your fraction will be number sold in 08 divided by number sold in 11 is equal to, go to your graph to find these numbers. Here you have 100 million, here you have 160 million. 2008 and 11, there are your two numbers, 100 divided by 160. And this calculator section, throw that in your calculator section, end up with 0 0.625, and you can go ahead and bubble that in. Okay, question 34, what they're asking for, what is the total number of 30 minute time slots that a station can sell for Tuesday and Wednesday? It's basically two time slots per hour on these two days, earlier in the problem, they confirmed that the station is broadcasting 24 hours per day, every day, which means that Tuesday will be 24 hours worth of time. Wednesday will be 24 hours worth of time. You'll have a total of 48 hours. There are 30 minute time slots, which means you get two time slots per hour. So times two time slots per hour, the hours cancel, and that will leave you with 48 times two is 96 total slots. So you can go ahead and bubble in 96. Problem 35, they're looking for what is the diameter of the base of a cylinder in yards, or the information that they give you earlier in the problem is the volume, and the picture gives you the height. And you might need to refer back to this picture here is given in the equation sheet that comes with the SAT. If you need it, it's there. So you can go ahead and copy that equation over. Volume is equal to pi r squared h. That's one of the biggest challenges, just remembering that you have that available to you on your equation sheet. Um, really what you need to do is rearrange in terms of r squared, but we'll actually hold off on that um, because they give you this information in terms of pi. So it might be a signal that some simplification is coming if, um, if you just leave that in terms of pi and don't solve for r right away. Um, you will have volume is equal to 72 pi is equal to pi r squared and plug in 8, the 8 yards. So at this point you can take, and I'll rearrange this a bit to show, 72 pi is equal to 8 pi times r squared, so you can say that r squared is equal to 72 pi divided by 8 pi. The pi's cancel, the pi's cancel. 72 divided by 8, you have, this is a calculator section, it's equal to 9. Um, to get r is equal to the square root of 9, which is equal to 3. So that means that the radius of your cylinder is equal to three, but careful not to bubble that in. Go back, always go back to what they're asking you for, and they're asking for what is the diameter of the base of the cylinder. So diameter, you go to radius times two, you go to two times, so you go to three times two, is equal to six. So go ahead and bubble in six as the diameter of the cylinder. Problem 36, what they're asking for is for you to find a value of x, which makes the function they give above undefined. And an undefined function is one which the denominator is equal to zero. So you can take everything about the above function, cross it out, and know that you need to get this denominator equal to zero. And they ask for what value of x, which indicates that there is a single value of x which makes this true. So you know you'll be looking to factor this equation into some form that reduces to x minus some constant or plus some constant. 
squared and then the sum polynomial is equal to zero. That's the form it needs to take. And that should signal that this equation here can be factored as a perfect square. And what a perfect square, if you're rusty, is that an equation that takes the form a squared plus 2ab plus b squared can be written as a plus b squared. And it's a little tricky to identify since the a in this case has the x within it. But the way you can write this is that a is equal to x minus 5 b is equal to 2, and you can see where a is at x minus 5, b is equal to 2, squared is equal to 4. In this case, you have the 2 times that b gives you the 4, times a is this x minus 5. So in this case, you can take this and write it as x minus 5. plus 2 squared and all that equal to 0. You can simplify the inside to say that you now have x minus 3 squared is equal to 0. And you can see at this point that x, the equation will equal when x is equal to positive 3. And that's your answer. And this is a pretty tricky one because it's relying on you to identify that sum of squares equation. But this is a stressful test. Perhaps you don't identify that the sum of squares is the way to factor this. It's not all lost. You can say that for what value of x, you know that they're going to be looking for um, a whole number here. So you can start to plug in, say, okay, the first one I'm going to try is what if x is equal to 0? When x is equal, oops, what if x is equal to 0? That will give you 0 minus 5 squared plus 4 times minus 5 plus 4, which will be 25 minus 20 plus 4 is equal to 9. So you know that's not correct. That does not equal 0. You can say, okay, what if x is equal to 1? Give you 1 minus 5 squared plus 4 times 1 minus 5 plus 4 is equal to 16 minus 16 plus 4. If you go to 4, also not correct, but you're starting to get closer to that 0. So you can continue on. What if x is equal to 2? 2 minus 5 squared plus 4, 2 minus 5 plus 4, that will give you 9 minus 12 plus 4 is equal to 1. So again, you're getting closer. So you can try your final one. If x is equal to 3, that will give you 3 minus 5 squared plus 4 times 3 minus 5 plus 4 and that will leave you with 4 minus 8 plus 4 which of course leaves you with 0 so that means that again x is equal to 3. So there's two ways to solve this. The easier way is to identify this as a perfect square um, and I definitely recommend reviewing perfect squares before the SAT. If not, and you have time, plugging in will get you the same answer. Question 37. The problem itself, pretty straightforward. What is the value of x in the expression? Where you go up top, find that x is this right here, which is the compounded interest expression. Um, they give you some information about it. Her initial deposit was $100. That already shows up in the expression. And her interest was 2% compounded annually. So even if you don't know anything about compounded interest, you know that the 100 already shows up, the 2% does not. That's probably has something to do with what x equals. So you can go ahead and write this down here. Value is equal to 100 times x to the power of t.
So if you know compound interest, you might already know the answer. If you don't, you can say, okay, what when I plot this, where do I end up? Let's say her interest was zero and it was just a steady rate. That would mean that X would equal one. So if X equals one, that would mean that every year, no matter what T was, one to the power of anything is one. So at that point, one to the power of anything is one. At that point, the value would be constant. So at that point, you can conclude X has to be greater than one. And how much greater than one does it need to be? Well, it needs to be greater than it by the percent interest that she's earning, which is 2%. The percent interest is 2%, which is equal to 0 0.02, which means that X is equal to that one that we just discussed, plus that 0 0.02 mean that x is equal to 1.02 and that's the answer you can bubble it in if you're unsure or you've never seen this type of equation before and what i would probably do if i was taking the sat i would run that value for a couple years forward you know what is that what is her value at year one at year two at year three make sure that the values you're getting make sense and then go ahead and bubble in that 1.02 problem 38 final problem so they have the same information as the previous problem um, but also adding in that they have Jessica's interest from the last problem, but also that her friend, Deshaun, opened an account which earns 2.5% interest annually on the same $100 initial deposit. And they're asking after 10 years, how much more money will Deshaun's deposit have than Jessica's? So basically what they're asking is the same thing that you did in the last problem, which is what is Jessica's interest is equal to, they give you that expression, it'll be 100 times your answer from the last problem, which is that 1.02, it kind of relies on you getting the last problem correct, the power of t, but we now know t is 10. And you can do the same thing for Tayshawn is equal to 100, but his interest is higher at 1, at 2, 5, and that's the power of 10. And calculator section, so you can plug that in to find for each of them, Jessica will earn 121. 0.899 and it's important to take this out to three decimal places at this point because they're asking for rounding the answer to the nearest cent so if you keep three decimal places then you can round you'll, you'll know exactly what to round to so if you keep three places so Tayshawn plugging in that is 128.006 take these subtract 121 um, 0.899 from 128.006, and what you end up with is 6.109. They say round to the nearest cent, and ignore the dollar sign, which means that that rounded will be 6.11. You can go ahead and grid that in as your answer for the increase um, for the value of Tayshawn's account versus Jessica's after 10 years.